Okay, here we go. So, um, welcome. This is the our number fifteen webinar, which is hard to believe. Um, but today we have the lovely, the talented Marissa Masria Katz. Welcome. Thank you. And we're going to be talking <laughs> about uh, making the news, and um, this is something I've thought about, and I, I realized my strategy in the past has been to try to get as much attention on the internet as possible and hope that some of the people that were looking were reporters and that they would get in touch with me. Which is kind of not really a strategy. Well, it's hard because there's a lot of people with that same strategy. Yeah. And how do you cut through that, right? I mean, that's- I think it used to work better in the, in the mid 2000s, but <laughs> it doesn't work as well for me anymore. <laughs> so you've thought it through a little bit more. Yeah, it was my job for a number of years to do that. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I like to, to think about um, news and, and, in fact, the title of this talk, which is, you know, Make the News. I think about my first editor that I ever had. and. Um, I used to come to him all the time with ideas and that I just thought were really interesting and I loved. And I and he was like, why now? And who cares? And he was very blunt with me. And I was hurt a little bit because I care. <laughs> you know, this is so fascinating to me. But when you come when it comes to the news, um, there's a lot of pressure uh, on journalists and newspapers and television news broadcasters to know why in this moment this needs to run and I think that helps us a lot in terms of getting that attention because people are kind of distracted a lot these days so if you can time it right and you know that people are going to be interested in that moment you really can get attention for some of the work that you're doing yeah. um, but it's all about that and so, um, just before we start, there was a couple things I wanted to say, but I got too excited. Uh, one is that we're recording this, so if for some reason you have like a connection problem, don't worry about it. You'll be able to watch it uh, later um, and review it. And um, if you have any questions, there's like a little question and answer section. You can write in questions, and we're going to be looking for projects like people that have stories that they would like to pitch to the press and you're going to help improve those pitches. So start thinking about that. We'll ask for that in a bit. Um, but uh, Marissa, you've been a reporter. Yes. You've been an editor. Yes. And you've worked with a lot of artists. Yes. That's all true, Steve. All of that is true. Yes. Um, I started off, um, actually, it's a weird thing. I kind of thought of myself as an artist in the beginning of my uh, life. I kind of came out of the womb uh, as an artist, an uh, actor, was obsessed with it, went to art school, went to NYU, and then uh, studied acting, and then also studied film. And so for a long time, I thought of myself as an artist, and then I slowly kind of veered away from that and moved into um, journalism. And I've been doing that for close to 15 years. And I've focused um, primarily on culture in various places around the world. Um, Middle East and North Africa was my first place that I was reporting from, but then I've been to others uh, for other publications throughout the years. Great. So let's start. You have you, this is where we're, we're beginning in this yeah. like, history of artists as reporters. Yeah, so I have here two pictures that I, are historic, and uh, just to point out that this notion of artists covering the news is not new and has always been in demand in various ways. On the left, which is my left, I'm not sure, is Dorothea Lange's um, picture that we have of her covering the Dust Bowl. Um, this is a incredibly famous image, but it, it really transcends time and, um, and really brought in people who saw this image to understand the situation that was happening. But of course, it's done not in a very sort of like 
typical photojournalist way, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of um, the unique framing, the, the way that the um, the woman is is looking. There's like a various various ways to look at it. And then on the right is Henri Cartier-Bresson's the photo of the Berlin Wall that was going up. Um, and again, these are not your typical photojournalist images. There's a lot of artistry that's here. Not to say that photojournalism doesn't isn't also incredibly artistic in its own way, but these are telling stories in, in a way that's not really traditional. And I think that's the whole point of, of us today talking is that people whose, whose focus and stories and practice, artistic practice, is perhaps not as obvious or straightforward really still have room, in my opinion, to break into major news media. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how the project that I worked on five, for five years did that, but there's also um, just when artists are thinking about, well, what's the legacy, where's the history of this kind of work, it's all over the place. And these are just two really famous examples of that, um, but that's just something I wanted to just kick it off with. Cool. So let's talk about Creative Time Reports. Right. So. This is my baby um, that I, I was deeply passionate about. So a lot of the work I did was uh, prior to joining Creative Time, which is the public art uh, nonprofit based in New York City that's been around for since 1973. Um, the work that I did before joining Creative Time was, like I said, co covering culture, oftentimes in uh, different places around the world. And, Ann Pasternak, who was the then president, um, had an idea to take a lot of the work of artists whose practices were really focused and addressing issues that are very relevant to our uh, to the news, and taking them and bringing them to a publishing platform that would then share these um, their work with major media. So this is our homepage, and our tagline was "Artists Unflinching." perspectives on the most challenging issues of our times. And so what we would do is we would reach out often to artists whose practice would be, let's say, on, um, uh, you, could, you know, you could say artists whose work like um, Boots Riley is focused on um, issues ranging from, Boots is a, is a singer and writer based in Oakland, and he addresses issues of minimum wage, equality, um, there's a lot, I mean, he's, he's really incisive on a lot of issues, but one of the things that he wanted to talk to us for the first time, for instance, was issues around minimum wage and um, the fight for 15. So, so you have someone like Boots, this amazing um, artist, and he, he's an expert on these issues, right? And then together with these artists, we would often think about how do we get their voices into mainstream media and we would take someone like Boots and we would work with him to write an op-ed on the fight for 15, for instance, that was the first time we worked with him. And in fact, it was, it was, at, it was a little bit more than the fight for 15. It was like a, a little bit bigger. That's a little oversimplifying it. Right. Um, but nevertheless, the idea of, of raising minimum wage. And, um, and then we would go to The Guardian with this op-ed. And um, what we were always looking for were artists whose practices made them really experts on these issues. And that was really important to us in so much as, um, you know, going to a newspaper and saying we'd like an artist to report on the news, well, you've got, they want to know why have you chosen this artist. Mm -hmm. And we would always have that in mind when picking the artist to report on these issues. Um, so well, that I, was, yeah. I, I was just going to say, the realizing that the research that you've done as an artist makes you an expert, not as an artist who does that, but as, you know, on that topic. So if you're an artist that does work that covers immigration, like you're doing a lot of research on immigration, and you're not, you're, you're an expert on artists that does that work, but you're also an expert on immigration. Exactly. That's what we were really looking for, were artists whose work was, let's say, on immigration, and they were in the field working on those issues in various forms. And over the years, through their field work, for, through their research, through their projects, they became, in our eyes, experts on this subject. 
the same way a journalist, you know, can be an expert on those issues. And what we love so much about artists is that they didn't work in traditional ways. And so they would upend the traditional takes, right? So they, they look at the world in a very, you know, a very different way, which is what was so exciting for us to highlight is the very um, unusual ways that an artist can look at the world. Yeah. And that's what I think we need in the media. You know, I know to, that's a very general statement, but we really need artists who, who can make us think about things in a radically alter, alternate way because we kind of are bombarded by the same type of thinking all the time. So yeah. who are those people? But it was important to us that whenever we, we worked with an artist that they really knew what they were talking about because it's sensitive stuff. Yeah. A lot of people are affected by it and I think it's important that you are very, um, you know, that you come to it with that kind of gravitas, right? Or that sure, sort of sure. But I think like more often we um, underestimate our expertise or like think that I have expertise as an artist, but you know, and, and oh, yeah. I mean that to me was always wanting to talk about capitalism and it's like, well, I kind of know some things I've talked to some people, you know, and like really in a way undervalued the expertise and the experience that I had in, in talking to hundreds of people about it. Right. Like that, that is a form right. of research. Well, uh, the interesting thing about that, just to say is that, um, uh, the media totally was fascinated and wanted these pieces. So that is to say that like artists, <laughs> there is a lot of interest for this type of work and your voice. And especially someone like you, Steve, I mean, in the cap we did two pieces together and the first one was um, based off of your capitalism project. And I think, yeah. um, uh, I mean, that was, you know, those kinds of things are really valuable and important. And the, the actually the most exciting thing for me as an editor was the very non-traditional ways information was collected by artists and incorporated into their practice. That was like more exciting to me than, uh, than, you know, kind of more book heavy or like, I don't know. Like I really yeah. liked yeah. artists who were in the field and working and understood things in a very tactile way. So you got these stories into a lot of different places. The, 316 stories over five years and the, and from 58 countries? Yeah. Um, you know, we were very, um, we felt it was really important that we worked with people all over the world. And um, mm -hmm. part of my job was to go to different countries and, and bring artists on board. And uh, we published in many different languages as well. We always privileged um, artists native language over English, so we would always translate work, and um, and yeah, so that was our, our big, our big goal was really to make sure that artists, artists' voices from everywhere that we could access and, you know, and could meet people were, were featured on the site. Yeah, and the thing we're looking at now is like, you, you didn't just have it happen on the Creative Time Report site, but you like figured out other ways to get these stories into other media, um, you know, like the the Guardian. I think was you had an ongoing relationship with the Guardian, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a lot of people um, who are maybe listening can can um, can relate to this. We are a really really small team, so I launched the project with um, Kareem Estefan, um, and uh, and together, you know. We, we, we formed the beginnings, you know, editorial team. And, you know, we're all a small nonprofit in New York and um, as much as much as the as many resources as we were able to give, the idea um, was like how how can we in everybody has a daily diet of sites that they like to um, right. read, right? And we we kind of didn't have necessarily the opportunity to be in the same category as the New York Times or Guardian or whatever. So if we could get onto those sites, we felt that that was a way for us to um, get people to read our work. And that was always the point was to have artist voices in mainstream media. And um, this was the first piece we did at the Guardian. Yeah. So this seems 
very possible, right? Like, I mean, kind of what you've shown, you were working on this um, hard for five years, but um, as an art, for the artists that are joining and watching this, like you can get in your perspective of your project, the research that you've done can get into the mainstream news. There is interest there if you frame it right. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So let's start uh, here. Um, this is something we were talking about before, is that like you think of the art section as the place where you're gonna get news coverage, but there's all these other sections of the paper. True, right. So um, I like these two examples. Um, you know, it's interesting. Bayate, um Ross Smith, he did a hyphenation. In fact, what's kind of amazing about him, and I just he's like a he's a really wonderful artist that I think we should all look to. Um, he's embedded in the New York Times right now. He's an embedded artist at the publication. And this mm -hmm. is a project he did called Hyphen Nation, where he interviewed people um, who are American um, and also of sort of who uh, who, and who can speak to their different. So that they may be um, Asian American or uh, Latin American, and then they sort of talk about their experiences. Um, with this hyphen, as he calls it, right? So hyphenation, and um, it's a beautiful video collage type um, film, and you, you can sort of scroll along the bottom and hear everybody's story, and then these beautiful um, illustrations will will come up. So it's not a very traditional way of telling people stories. It isn't sort of just you know a video camera and you sit and you hear it. It's kind of has this mixture to it, and. Um, and it's this really would be like in the national section or the culture section. I mean, really, he's in every part of the Times because yeah. Yeah. he's employed by the Times and like uh, as yeah. a reporter. But um, it's a way of getting that story into uh, all kinds of, yeah, or having your perspective in out of the art section. Yeah, I mean, like if you go to this actual um, page, you and you read the description, it literally says that you know he's embedded in the Times, and he's working with POV too. Okay. So I think um, you know it's a collaboration, and um, but he's one to watch in terms of of really unique, interesting ways of working within within a traditional uh, publication. And then your other example yeah. was. Um, Molly Crabapple doing illustrations of the Republican National Convention. I'm sure commentary also, right? Yeah, I mean, she's just the most, you know, um, she's incredibly prolific and incisive, and she's got a wonderful sense of humor and take on things. And I think Molly is all, always one of the people that I hold up as the example of artists in the news, you know, we worked together on several occasions, and then, um, I mean, she's just, you know, she's like in her own um, incredible, like, she's on her own journey right now, and she is asked quite a bit to work um, for so many different publications, and and yeah. she, I mean, the list is long. But she did. She went. She covered the Republican National Convention here, and she illustrated it, and she also reported on things she saw and felt, and. Again, not a traditional a take on what happened, um, not CNN's version, Molly's version, but really so much texture and heart. And you know, yeah. you read it and you're like, you get a real sense of what's happened there in that moment. You know? And these two examples are really like of artists who are kind of, um, well, to reference the earlier one, like hyphen artist, hyphen journalist, right? Like where they're they're doing both jobs, um, and then there's like a, a simpler way of all right, what's my project, and what's the um, what are the other sections? When when I w did more work with Creative Capital, we used to talk about this a lot of like what are the other topics that are in your projects, and what are the other sections of the newspaper they can go in, and then approaching journalists about you know like in the business section or in the sports section about this, you know, with that angle um, to get the project or your perspective featured in that way. But it's really about, um, as you pointed out, like coming at them at the right time, right? And in the right way. So yeah, I mean, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, also the other thing is that it, um, 
a little secret of mine would be <laughs> what I used to do before I knew ed editors. Not, I'm not saying that this is a strategy. I'm actually going to say that it's, you know, I used to basically try to figure out email addresses of, um, of, of editors. So, like, if I knew that there was a pattern or, or at the times there isn't a pattern, um, you kind of, I like would play around a little bit and then I would write my formal pitches to them. And sometimes that works, sometimes it didn't. But the wonderful thing is that a lot of journalists now are on Twitter and Facebook and you don't have to figure it out and like, <laughs> you know, do, do it that way. So yeah. that's another thing like we can talk about um, even a little bit later, but there are ways of reaching people who write about um, who, you know, writers in ways that like they're, they're eager, they want stories too. So I think there's, um, and there's ways we can talk about reaching them and, and the best right. way to do that. Yeah. yeah, they might care about the issue but not about art and you can connect the, the dots yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. Okay, so let's talk about timing here. You've got some uh, slides here about timing, so. Uh, yeah, that was hugely important to us. Um, like I mentioned before, um, we were small. Uh, we had at most a, a team of four, um, but that was only for like a really short period of time. So right, so ha and even that in terms of like a publication is 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 small. So what we would do is we would look at the calendar way in advance, right at the beginning of the year. We would look ahead and we say there are certain anniversaries that we know are going to be happening. Right? right, and so we wanted to look ahead and say we know that there will be some interest in this story at this time. And um, anniversaries are really, like I said, good events. When we knew a you know Supreme Court decision was coming down the pipeline that was going to be hotly contested, um, when we uh, we knew an election was happening, so that's how we would think because our resources wouldn't allow us to move very quickly. Also, I think one of the things when, because as artists, I think you don't need to move very quickly. I think one of the things that make um, artists really special is their ability to sort of slowly react and not, you know, shoot from the hip. I mean, although that's also okay, but I do yeah. think part of an artist's practice is to absorb and respond and take their time, and sometimes that's kind of contrary to how media works, which is extremely fast and really like quickly responding. And so since we don't have the advantage of that, um, I often think, uh, you really should look ahead at, and also think about um, you know, what are the things that apply to the work that I do and what will be really relevant to a large audience. So while we talk about this, I think what I'm going to ask, uh, what might be fun is to have people in the chat just sort of write like, what's an issue that they're working on and then what's something that we could anticipate in the next year that they could connect. That's uh, great. Let's do it. To, right. So <laughs> if you were yeah, so yeah, two parts. One is what is the issue you're um, working on in the little question box you can write. What's the issue you're working on and then what's a date or something, uh, an anniversary or an event that's coming up in the next year that you could connect it to. And while that comes in, we can talk about these examples that you brought. So um, let me advance us here. We got um, this one. Tell us about this. So um, this is from Andre Sereno. This was right after Charlie Hebdo happened. In fact, it wasn't right after. It took a little time again. Um, but you know, Andre Sereno, Serrano. I might be pronouncing it wrong. I, I've I been said Serrano, like the pepper. Serrano. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I've never met him. I, 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 I anyway. <laughs> I worked with him a couple of times, and he's wonderful. And obviously, his piss Christ um, was part of the culture wars, uh, um, and um, obviously, like he's somebody who knows quite a bit about um, censorship. So he was very much wanting to respond to what happened with Charlie Hebdo, and um, and so this was a piece we did a. a, a 
an op-ed he wrote for that ran in Salon. So and that was right. That was like part of the news cycle, right? That was immediate. He was responding to something that happened right then and there. But of so course, there must be the kind of thing where it's like he saw the Charlie Hebdo thing happen, and it's like I need to write something, and it is sort of an immediate reaction, or not immediate, but within a few weeks. Yeah. Yes, it is. It was within a few weeks, so it wasn't like in like like a lot of people wrote things that day, right? That did not happen. But um, it happened uh, pretty soon after, and um, and it was still very much part of the news cycle, and um, yeah, and so that and and we saw him as an expert given what he went through, right? Like that's what made it. Yeah. And I imagine him writing this, it's not the first time he's thought about these kinds of things, right? So it, not, for yeah. him, it's not difficult to sort of come up with a couple paragraphs of ideas. Um, all right, so let's look at the, the next one here, which is, uh, oh, the Selma March anniversary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Wendell Pierce is actually an artist that we worked with. He's an actor. Um, a lot of you may know him from The Wire, and this was the anniversary of Selma, and he was in, um, you know, he was in a, he's just, this is an issue for him that he's has covered, and we also, Creative Time, had worked with him on, um, in New Orleans right after um, Hurricane Katrina. So he was somebody that we were close with and um, very much felt that he would be, you know, excellent to write about this. Right. Um, and so you knew the anniversary of the Selma March was coming up, and you probably started this uh, yeah. knowing you months in advance. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. This is something that ran on our site. Um, it was the 15th year that we've been in Afghanistan, and Steve Mumford is an incredible artist who was embedded, actually, um, and in the you know as a as a artist, and he uh, makes these incredible paintings, um, and you can see it on our site. Um, and he he just we also we interviewed him actually. Um, this was a little bit. This didn't run in a partner site. This just ran on Creative Time Reports. But I do think it's a very good example of these moments when we're like, oh, we're taking stock on how many years we've been in Afghanistan. 15 years is something that you can kind of, that you can say is, is can make the news in the sense. Like, yeah, it implies like it's time to reflect, right? Yeah. So it's usually like a year anniversary, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25. Yeah. It tends to be, um, so, you, you know, it's not like at, um, year three or year seven, those tend to not um, be as resonant. Be the cell. Yeah. Um, so this is something you guys realize. You're looking at the calendar saying, okay, what are the, what are the dates around yeah. the world? Yeah, great. Okay. And then you have this one, which you call Evergreen. Yeah, so this is this is one that I think a lot of artists are going to be able to um, connect to, right? Because the issues of the NSA and the Snowden uh, revelations, that was something that we were talking about for a long time, you know, and like it touched on all of us. And as we were sort of unpacking the documents and understanding them, um, you know, that didn't happen. I mean, that there was no way we could just respond to it and then let it go. I mean, so much came out of that, right? And it still continues in, in its own way um, to be something that we can we keep discussing, right? It, it just changes over time. But someone like Trevor Paglin, who's an artist who's really worked on these issues for a number of years, he had this idea um, to fly over the uh, national intelligence agencies, our top intelligence agencies, at night and take images of them um, and and then uh, make them available in the public domain so anybody could use them mm. at any time. And in fact, you didn't even have to attribute it to him. Um, they're they're just available, and they and and that is something that continues to be obviously used and. Here are two examples of ways in which um, 
You know, the one on the right is the Human Rights Watch, um, how it became sort of the, the cover for their report, their major report, um, at, on, on issues of surveillance. And then um, on the left was the, this book by Arundhati Roy and John Cusack, in which they used his image of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Yes, that's John Cusack. The, the actor John Cusack, and, and they, uh, they used it for that book. But it's been used by a lot of different people in various ways. And, um, but again, that wasn't tied to like a date or anything specific, right? right? And the wonderful thing about that was we actually partnered with The Intercept um, to publish that piece. Great. It was, it was kind of a long, um, it was a long process, and they were part of, you know, after the images were created, they were very much part of, of creating the text that accompanied it and um, that Trevor had, had written. And so there's like a lot of um, uh, cooperation on that one. So that's something we can talk about later, the little bit more in-depth pieces that can sure. also be considered. So some, some people have uh, br brought in some issues and, and timing yeah. around them. So one is, uh, Zeph, Zeph says gentrification, they could use the dates of particularly controversial evictions, um, the eviction of a hundred year old Iris Canada here in San Francisco or the historic eviction of the International Hotel. So the anniversary of those yeah. evictions or, you know, just kind of thinking like when the, when was the, were, uh, I forget what, the Ellis Act in San Francisco was a big uh, law that changed how evictions could be done and like figuring out when that was and what are the anniversaries around it or other legislation that was passed. Well, um, also the interesting thing is that of course something like that would be really, I imagine um, could be really interesting to the, to the San Francisco Chronicle, right? Like an op-ed yeah. at, that, at that anniversary. But the thing about San Francisco, just to say, is that it has national, the issue of gentrification is, is kind of interesting on, on a national scale as well. So I wouldn't say that you even need to limit it to your local publications because we're all thinking about San Francisco and gentrification. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you could pitch to the Guardian, you know, yeah. the comments is free section. Do you ever make like big leaps with the anniversary? So it's like Google, when Google came to the Bay Area and then try to connect that and that anniversary and then try to connect that to Jim. Oh yeah, that, the more inventive ways that you can think about anniversaries, the better. Like uh -huh. really, it's, it's really good. Like that's an awesome one, Steve. That's a really great way of thinking. When did Google come? And like, and if somebody could weirdly like pr track the progress or the changes or the, you know, of, of like what happened that, you know, uh, like creating a visual culture to these things are very key. And that's what artists can do for us because we like that's what Trevor's project did. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, so much money is going to these agencies, and we have no way. We don't even know what they look like. We don't know how big they are. We don't know what anything. And then all of a sudden, you have these images of these buildings that everyone's talking about, and 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 you can kind of in a in a way it helps you to wrap your head around it. And right. so let's say it is Google coming to the Bay Area, and then you can sort of if there's like a map that. And, and I'm sure people have done this in, in, in various ways, but like creating something that can really help people understand how much it's changed and altered the landscape as a result. So, well, you've got some other ones. Uh, this is Erin, and she says, diversity and inclusion on campus. Um, and then the timing would be related to upcoming legislation and protests. Um, Jeff Sessions reversing the former Department of Justice investigations into action or lack thereof, anniversaries of campus protests, anniversaries of the diversity, equity, and inclusion programming launch at the University of Michigan, which is where she's teaching. So it's like, I think she's thinking about it the same way, like legislation yeah. that's coming up, legislation that's passed, but really, I think the, the thing you said before about your editor saying like, why now? And just having an answer yeah. for this date is important. The other thing just to say is like when school starts, that's a good time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, September, everyone's going back to school it's after Labor Day. That's all we're thinking about. Right. right. Okay. Um, so, oh, Zeph also wanted to add for San Francisco, the anniversary of the first tech bus uh, shuttle, right? Um, for the first tech bus protest. 
That's yeah. awesome. I also, I also just to say that that that's something that totally fascinates me. So again, I think this is great for local newspapers, but also national um, publications. Um, and then uh, we'll do one more, uh, which is Ray Ray, and the the issue is awareness. Oh, Ray Ray. Of yes, I read about Ray Ray. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Awareness of state-by-state -state primary election access variances, felony affiliation, ballot access closed, open mixed. Okay, Ray Ray submitted something also about um, a local, a public square that's potentially up for grabs. Right. So, uh, sorry, I was responding to that, but this is different, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the issues are around um, the different laws of uh, around primary elections and um, let's see, voting methods and age variances. Uh, so rank choice voting and 16 years of age. Um, <laughs> Ray Ray says you can talk about the public square too, but um, but it's around voting issues. So how do we connect that to a date? I mean, obviously there's primary election days or voter registration, you know, Voter registration coming up, or or the last chance to register to yeah. vote. Yeah, well, I, think, to think of? I think that's a, a great one. It's really important to all of us. Obviously, the primaries, the general elections, these are all good. But you might be competing with like a lot of people on those at those times. Um, that's another thing to think about. Like, you can um, maybe sometimes smaller events. So if there are certain laws. Um, you know, that are pa being passed in Texas, but that are getting national attention, that's a, also a good time to mm. think about striking, right? Um, but also, of course, the primaries and getting ready for that, and I think this is just also an evergreen issue. Personally, I mean, I would say that um, we're watching dynamics shift on the ground as we speak, and so I, I wouldn't, necessarily think that voting has to be tied to an election. Sometimes it may, it may help, but like this is, everybody's talking about this constantly, so. So let's move on to this uh, next question. Um, just to give you a heads up, we have about 15 minutes, so. Okay. Um, but I think we're working in the pitch parts into this, so we'll, we'll be okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, but obviously one of the questions the editor is going to ask if you go to them is like, well, who are you, right? <laughs> so yeah. um, how, do, how do we answer that? So, you know, the way to think about that, you know, sometimes it's a matter of a paragraph or a few sentences is that I've been working on X issue for 10 years. Uh, my work has been exhibited on these uh, issues um, in, in various places. I mean, that's how we would uh, take artists and um, get them in the Guardian is, is we would say, well, this artist is, has been doing this kind of work for various years. Therefore, we believe that they can really expertly talk about this issue. Now, if you don't have an editor um, doing that for you, you need to include, in my opinion, a short paragraph and as well as like links to past work or your own personal website that really helps people to see um, precisely like what makes you the perfect person for this subject. So it's sort of establishing your credibility uh, and not expecting them to take it for granted. Exactly, yeah. So it's, um, you say here like your experience and you're committed. I guess it's just showing that, demonstrating that experience and commitment. Um, yeah. So tell you us know, about this, this story. Is a great, this is a great um, project that, again, this is a little bit more of an intensive relationship in, in so much as like we work on this for a few months with uh, the artist and then uh, um, as well as Al Jazeera America. So um, Sim Chi Yin, um, she's, she's been uh, working on this. She, this. This project was actually the result of a five-year survey of underground housing um, in, in Beijing. Um, and it may have been beyond Beijing too, but as far as I, I remember, um, she spent a lot of time. Um, uh, there are quite a few migrants within China that have come to the, to the city and then have been living um, below ground. Right. And she 
working on this issue for so many years. And we worked with Al Jazeera America for this very big piece um, that ran on their site and we created a film for them. And I think at this point, at this point it's been viewed over 100,000 times on, on our YouTube channel, the Creative Time Reports YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, so like when Al Jazeera says, well, what, yeah, who is this person? Why, why are they the right person to tell this story? Is the answer she's been working in these spaces for five years or? Yeah, and it's also showing some of the work that she's done around it, right? So they, I mean, I don't want to step into their heads, but I mean, I'm assuming that they saw these images and they're like, I, would, I, I was really blown away by her work. This like yeah. deeply moved. And I was also, what I like very much is, I, is the way in which she, they are, people are photographed. It, it feels like she's in, she has an intimate kind of uh, relationship in so much as uh, obviously professional, but there's like a, there's attention paid uh, to her subjects and hearing their stories and a sensitivity that I think is really special. And that's why we were so attracted to working with her, that we could see um, a deep knowledge on the subject and on the issues and we felt very compelled to work with her. Yeah, it's another argument, you know, I'm sure it's uh, almost doesn't need to be said, but like for making great documentation of your work so that you can show these uh, editors, like, this is what I can give you. You know, like, these are these striking images. Um, there's someone that's in the, she's a regular on our webinars, uh, President Margaret McCarthy, who is the first female president of the United States. She's operating a shadow government. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she has these really great images of her like shaking people's hands and kissing kids and stuff and like yeah. campaigning that um, that make for a really, you know, you can describe it, but seeing the pictures makes it all that more compelling. Totally. Um, um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, tell me about this. Well, this is a very... Um, a special piece to me. Uh, this is the very first time we we partnered with a major media. Uh, this was Foreign Policy magazine, and um, it's one of my favorite magazines. And <laughs> I mean, just to say, we love that artists who you know would not normally be contributors were the ones that were being featured here. Like that was like such a joy for us, right? Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, and also that they can offer something radically different than what might be mainstream of the publication. And um, Ahmed Matar, who's an incredibly talented photographer based in Saudi Arabia, has been working in Mecca for um, many years, and he's sort of been going through and documenting the change that's happening in the city. And we were able to, um, because this was the, uh, the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage, um, for Muslims, we were able to run this piece, uh, and that's when it debuted was during the Hajj, um, and that was how we were able to get the editors to run it too. It's like this is a very special time. We'd like to to work with you, um, share with you these images, and um, and they were very different than the normal uh, images that you might see from the pilgrimage, right? Right. right. So it's the difference, actually, the the unusualness, the 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 fact that it's not like the pictures we've seen before or the take that we've had before that is what's compelling. Totally. That's exactly what it, that's exactly what sold yeah. it for us. So. Good to know. Because I, I, sometimes it feels like we don't fit in and the fact that we don't fit in is actually. Well, that's, that's totally the, the thing I think that made it, you know, easier for us to convince a lot of editors. But like I said in the beginning, I just want you to know that people are really, really wanting this kind of content. Mm. We, we were not, I, it was not very often that I, that my emails were completely ignored and I was screaming to get, you know, e responses. I was, people were very interested in, in this kind of work. Um, right. So I, I think people should be optimistic about their voices. So form fits function. Tell me about that. Yeah, no, I think that um, one of the things that was really wonderful about Tatiana Fazlala's day, um, her work, is that she makes these really beautiful 
um, and striking and uh, powerful images, um, you know, for a, a project of hers that, you know, um, which is "Don't Tell Me to Smile," and it's sort of a um, she wheat pastes them all, all over the city, and um, we loved, you know, we loved this this work that she was doing, and we had her really talking about these issues and fighting street harassment and. Um, um, you know, what that means and how men have a responsibility to fight it. And so um, we did an op-ed with her. But like one of the things that we we were, um, when we were contacting the editor at Salon, we showed um, him this work and said, well, here's where it's coming from. It's all this, all this experience she has in, in, in making this kind of work. And um, and here's why you need to run this piece. And and again, this is an evergreen issue. This was this was not something that like um, something happened and uh, we we responded. It was something we worked with her on and and um, then approached them. Yeah. Um, so I think for the people in our audience, the the question here is like. What for you to answer is why are you the right person for the job? And and there there is an answer, but it's not like oh I guess I'm not you know. <laughs> but thinking about um, you know what is your experience, the commitment that you've shown, what is the, this new perspective, and and how can you incorporate it into what editors are looking for? But we're gonna wrap up here with um, how you pitch an idea and yourself. We've talked about it a bit. You yeah, have we really we have covered it. Um, and I, but I do think that um, importantly, uh, the very first thing that you need to to do is really ask yourself the why now, and, uh -huh. and who's going to care? Because sometimes an issue is going to be really important to your local community that the a national paper might not be able to find room for because it's a little too site specific or. Yeah. Um, so you need to ask yourself that, you know, who's who's going to be interested in this? And and the why now is like really always needs to come first when it comes with the news. Um, and then once you've, let's say you've landed on the, the why now and the who cares and all of that, then you need to really craft a, not a very long, but like a pithy pitch document, you know, or email that you'll send to these editors. And um, and you're going to in that, in my opinion, what I would start off with is like the 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 why now needs to come first. You know, on June 18th, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. I've created. Um, I believe that there's a story on this issue, mm -hmm. and here's what I propose doing. I've been working on this issue for 15 years with various projects. I know these people and I would like to incorporate a lot of these ideas within the story or the op-ed. Um, op-eds, for instance, uh, for The Guardian are six to eight hundred words. One of the things you can Which do... Which I have to say, as someone who wrote for you, it's just way shorter than you'll ever... <laughs> it's so much shorter than you want it to be. It totally, it's so short. And then that's also like something that I think is very valuable for people to do before you pick up the pen or write that email to your editor or to the editor, study the section that you see your piece going in, right? Knowing that the, they only run something that's 600 to 800 words is so valuable to an editor or knowing the section that it runs in and saying, I saw your piece on X and here's my blah, blah, blah. It, these things are so wonderful for editors to, to know that you, you know the tone, you know the length, and you understand the, the rhythm and all of those things. Like That is a, a wonderful thing to do when you, when you make it yourself. Okay. Um, so, is do you, is it okay if we just jump ahead to questions? Yeah, sure. We have a few minutes left, um, so let's go here. So, um, and while people are sending in questions for Marissa, um, did you want to talk about those slides of Trevor and how that relates to a pitch? Or sure, yeah, the Trevor slide. Um, again, for for me, it was just like here's a wonderful website of an artist and his work. 
and I think there's a lot of people that you can you can find but okay so let's say you've never heard of Trevor Paglin before you're an editor and he gives you here's my website you click on it and you're like oh I can see all of his books all of his artist talks his his you know his videos images like I'm immediately um, informed as to who this person is and what he does and why he's the potential person, you know, the right person for the job. Right, right. Um, and while we're, it takes a few seconds for people to type in their questions, so go for it, do it now. Um, but I was gonna say, one of the things, again, we, we dealt, when I taught with Creative Capital, we would talk about getting press every once in a while, and one of the things that stuck with me is that the reminder that every day uh, all the pages of the newspaper start empty and then and they need to get filled right and the, the news broadcast your local news broadcast the national news broadcast that half hour starts with nothing and then they fill it right and so you, you're you're offering something that they can fill that space with that they need to fill like they they want this right oh, um, yeah. they really and, really do yeah, yeah. And, you know, if they don't get it, the paper is empty, right? So here's a good question from Lindsay. What if we're emerging artists without a lot of street cred? You know, I still think there's, you've got a lot to say probably. And I think, um, I think that your pitch is how you're going to, uh, to get your idea across. So really honing that and fine tuning that and maybe getting a friend who's a journalist to take a look at it and see if it's appealing and really asking all those questions that we discussed are, are ways in which you're going to get people interested. Um, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd be down to hearing what a student has to think about what's happening um, on campus life and they probably haven't, you know, they've just started in their careers. So I, I would, I would just, I would just think about the things that interest you, what you feel you can do, and um, and this idea of like having, you know, the street cred is important, but the way in which you can articulate what you want to do is also hugely important, even more so, I would say. Yeah, and I think the credibility, you get some through a track record, but you also can balance that out through how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that you know it's not like that's the only part of the pitch you're putting together you can just sort of wait other or try to emphasize other things right well like I I mean for me I didn't I mean I had no clips when I would started writing I mean I you got to start somewhere right like <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. so um, so I would you know what I did to, to get me you know some of these first jobs was just I would study the publications that I wanted to write for and figure out like okay I know how to write about this and I can come up with that and something they haven't done in a long time I'm gonna present something new so that's you know there's a ways in so let's do we'll do one more question and then we should uh, I want to make sure we try to get out of here on time um, while we're answering that I'm just gonna put up the slide with um, your info in case people want to check out your site um, uh, so there that is but uh, also, that, they can email me from the my emails on that site so like feel free to get in touch and I wasn't gonna offer that for you but I'm glad you said it <laughs> well it's there so and I'm not taking it down so anybody who you know wants to get in touch <laughs> great I'd be, happy to, I'd be happy to share some opinions so here's our last question thoughts on the balance of getting press for yourself as an artist and getting press for an organization you're working with uh, populations of people who are central to the project but are not getting media, media attention. So, um, yeah, what do you think? Like for the cause versus for yourself or for the people involved? Oh, here's, here's some more detail here. How to make sure it benefits everyone and the artist's voice doesn't end up being larger than or speaking for the voices of the other folks who may be more marginalized? Well, um, that's interesting. I feel like there's quite a lot of different ways about that. I think the artist can probably approach the editor or the writer who might be um, interested in covering this and then um, and they can also ensure that the people who are very central to the story also get interviewed. I mean I think 
being very clear is, is the key to getting a more balanced uh, approach. Yeah, I'm reminded, have you ever seen that James Noctway war photographer movie? No. He's like, it's famous war photographer and very yeah, dangerous. No, I know he is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a part where he's talking about how when he takes someone's picture, even if he doesn't speak the language, uh, that there's sort of this implied permission and that, you know, he looks at them and they say, okay, and he kind of takes the picture and that they know that because he's taken their photo that that image will get out into the world and more people will see it and that it's actually, he's doing a service. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not a perfect person and if you watch the movie, you might think like, man, Lambert, whoa, he missed all this other stuff. I did see it, but, um, but you know, like that, that part resonated with me of, um, you know, the it, speaking for versus speaking on behalf, like there might be a difference there and that getting this story into the news is pushing that issue forward. And so, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think it's really important if somebody is more suited to talk about something because they're living that, that experience, you make sure that whoever's writing that story speaks to them, that they get quotes from them. Um, and you, that, that's the way that you do it. That's the way that you kind of make sure that everybody is, is, is part of the, the story in a more, like I said, balanced way. Right. So um, I think we're going to wrap up and try to end on time here, but um, I just wanted to say thank you, Marissa, for doing this. Thank really you. really appreciate it. And thanks great. for everybody spending the time uh, with us today. And uh, you know how to reach Marissa. And, uh, and yeah, you have the links for everything. Our next webinar, I think, is going to be in about a month. We are still planning it. I'm working on getting an expert on uh, professional wrestling. Uh, huh. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, that I'll think about that. Yeah. And if you're, well, I want to see, Donald Trump was, you know, a WWE star. And I want to see how good guys turn to bad guys, because that does happen in wrestling. Uh-huh. It's like a useful thing to know about how to do, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we're working on that. We're working on some other ones. Um, we'll put you all on our mailing list. If you're not, you can always unsubscribe, but uh, you, that way you'll know about the next uh, upcoming webinar, and we will be in touch that way. But thank you again for your... Thank you for all you do, Steve. Really, uh, really thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right, we got to go. All right. <laughs> but I that. <laughs> Talk to you soon, I hope. All right. Thanks, Marissa. Bye. Bye.